I, 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 was, I was asked maybe to say a word or two about what the discovery was itself uh, that, that, and, and, and that led to this. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just, you know, in a nutshell, just describe, describe what, what it was for those who, who, haven't, who haven't heard. Uh, this, this began with a, a project uh, which several of us, of us here in the room, although I'm looking for Rich and Carl, um, uh, we're, we're working on, and we, uh, we realized that, um, that by studying, ah, uh, right back there, it's not good. We realized that um, by, uh, because we've been developing a, a technique um, that actually uh, was something that Louis Alvarez um, had recommended, uh, uh, a a Nobel laureate advisor, uh, uh, to find supernova with using the newly capable uh, automated you know, capabilities that you can do with computers. Um, we end with the uh, detectors that are now in the back of every one of these cameras, the CCD detectors that are uh, so ubiquitous these days. Uh, we now could actually find supernova in a much more organized way. Um, uh, Carl actually has, has suggested that we um, try out the same idea going much, much further and, and see whether we could um, see, find supernova far enough away that they could act as measuring uh, distance markers um, across the universe. And we could do an experiment that had been proposed, oh, 50 years earlier um, uh, by, uh, by Bada and Zwicky um, to measure the slowing of the expansion of the universe. And the idea is that back you know, in the 30s, and Hubble saw that the universe apparently is, is getting bigger all the time, all the distances between galaxies are increasing. Um, it was we recognized that you might expect that that would be slowing down um, because all the gravity in the universe, all the stuff in the universe would attract each other and it would slow the expansion. And so the obvious question was, well, how much is it slowing down? And is it slowing enough? Is there enough stuff in the universe that it could slow down to the point that it would come to a halt someday and perhaps turn around and collapse? In which case, we could discover that the universe was really going to come to an end. And this was uh, you know, getting towards the end of the, of, the, uh, of the century, and we were thinking that this would be a you know, great millennial project to be able to walk around saying that the universe is coming to the end if we have any data. <laughs> <laughs> or, or not. As case may be. And I, I thought it was exactly the kind of project that uh, you know, any, any scientist would love, because you're getting to ask a potentially very philosophical question. You know, a question about you know, the fate of the universe, and it also turned out to be connected with this little minor question of whether the universe was infinite or not, and uh, in space. And we thought that was you know, a pretty fun question too. And so you know, I couldn't imagine a better project that you could actually ask such a philosophical question by going out and making measurements of the brightnesses of these exploding stars. And each star that exploded, um, it sent a signal to you. It travels for you know, a billion or two billion or four billion years to reach us. And it gets fainter on its way. Uh, by the time it reaches us, it looks uh, much fainter. And of course, um, you can tell how far away it is by how faint it is for these particular kinds of supernova where they're all intrinsically about the same brightness when they be. So that means that you can say, oh, this supernova here, um, that light has been traveling for two billion years. And that supernova there, it exploded four billion years ago. And so if you had this whole series of supernova, you could mark off different points in the history of, of the universe. Each supernova could also tell you a very important piece of information, which is how much has the universe expanded since the time that the light left that supernova. And that's just because as the universe expands, everything that's not nailed down in that universe expands with it. And that includes the very wavelengths of the photons of light that are traveling to us from the distant supernova. So the light leaves these supernovas, this material kind of supernova, looking mostly blue, that's a short wavelength. By the time it reaches us, it's been stretched right along with the universe, and it looks red, um, the, redder, the, the more stretch of the universe since the time of the explosion, uh, the more uh, red that that light looks. It's called redshift, as many of you know. And so, in the end, all we have to do is take the redshift and the brightness of the supernova, and we were able to plot the uh, stretch of the universe, how much universe has stretched since each of the different times that one of the supernovas represents. And what we found when we looked at the plots, um, as, as of course you know, is that we did not see the expected curve of the universe slowing down due to gravity. Um, it clearly wasn't slowing down enough to come to a halt. In fact, it wasn't slowing down at all. It apparently had been speeding up in the whole last half of the universe that we were watching. So this was, uh, was what we saw. Um, of course, uh, everybody asks, you know, what, what was the aha moment? And uh, I always say that it, was, it wasn't much of a aha in the conventional sense because you know, you first plot up the data, just managing to get all your raw data onto the plot, and before you finish doing all your calibrations and, and, and tests, and the data's all over here on the wrong side of the plot. And you say, well, you know, okay, we, we haven't done the calibrations yet, what do you expect? And we then calibrated, and we then worked, and we reworked, and over the course of months and months, 
um, we managed to convince ourselves that actually uh, we had the, the data didn't need any much further calibration. In fact, whenever we calibrated, the data looked more strongly suggesting that the, uh, the surprise was what we were seeing. So by the end of four months, as a group, we pretty much decided that this was uh, this is what we were going to have to go with, and we were going to have to tell the scientific community that this is a surprising result. Here's the reason that we believe it, but we think it's true. And uh, so in that sense, I can say this is probably the, 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 the slowest uh, ha <laughs> a year ago. Uh, so, so, so this, this is the discovery, and of course, now with, with all the community of, you know, of uh, scientists here, we've been having the fun ever since trying to figure out why is this universe doing such a crazy thing? Why is it speeding up? And you know, it, it could be um, that, as Bob had mentioned, uh, most of the universe is dominated by a dark energy that pervades all space and is causing this acceleration. It could be, perhaps even more surprising, uh, that Einstein's theory of general relativity needs a little bit of a tweak, um, perhaps uh, acting slightly differently on these very large scales of the, uh, of, of the universe. Um, but at this moment, I would say that the question is wide open, and it's really the place where the, the, uh, the measurements have to fill in the, the, fill in the gaps. The theorists have been working very hard. Um, we, I think I had a quick look, and we're estimating that there's a paper basically every day since the discovery um, from, uh, with some theoretical ideas on, on the topic. And, uh, and so you know, there's no lack of theories, um, but we really need some more guidance from the actual measurements. And so that's really where all the work is going on that we're, that we're, doing, that we're doing next. So I, I, the only other thing I, I comment, I've written down that I want to comment on about is that um, I think this kind of prize is, is a really a great moment uh, just to, to step back and think about what it is that we are able to do together as humans when, when, we, when we work together. That this kind of, well, this science in particular is, is a case where you know, many, many different cultures and, and, and uh, civilizations actually have contributed bits of, of the concepts that we now use in our understanding of, of the universe. So it's really a, a, a human story going, going far back. And it also um, you know, recognizes what's possible to do when whole communities of science um, come together and, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and are able to work together in, in the way that they, they did in, in this project. In particular, um, it, there were these two international teams uh, one of them uh, that you know, was centered here, but was at, at, uh, members all over all over the world. The other team um, was uh, well led from Australia, but also all over the world. And and the fact that um, those two teams together um, ended up representing a good fraction of the community of supernova scientists uh, when you put them all all, all together, um, I think really reflects very well the sense in which this kind of result doesn't come up, come about um, from you know a, a lone scientist walking down a lab coat to a lab to a laboratory. It's really the work of a whole community of people um, working together in, in, in uh, choosing ideas and concepts um, that makes this kind of thing possible. And, uh, and I think people forget that science isn't a, a lonely activity. It's really uh, made the ultimate social group activity um, that, that I may know about. Um, they, let's see, what else was I going to comment? Um, oh, uh, I was also going to comment that the, I, I, I sort of love the fact that this particular result is show some of the two-headed aspects of, um, of, 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 of discovery like this. On the one hand, it was only possible to discover um, what we did because of how much, um, as, as, a, as a science you know, a field, we've, uh, physics, we've come to understand about the universe, that we use all the pieces that we put together in the puzzle in order to interpret what we were seeing in the supernova data. And that allowed us to, to, make, this, to make this measurement. So it's amazing how much we figured out. But on the, you know, the two-headed, the other hand, um, it's uh, amazing how big mystery can still be left over and how much we still have left to discover. And so I think one of the real pleasures of doing science, um, I, I hope throughout uh, you know, any, any day in the next you know, uh, few centuries, um, is this idea that you're going to be able to build on so much that we figured out, and yet there's so much more for us to discover. And so it's, it's, I think it's one of the real pleasures of, of this kind of result that you get to see it, writ large. Very large, in this case. Um, let's see, what was I going to comment also? Um, oh, and, and, then, and I was going to comment that, uh, that in some sense, you know, these two aspects of science remind us that really science is a method, uh, you know, not just a, not a finished product, and, and that we don't know where it will lead or what new magic it will give us the power to do in the future. So you know, we have no idea whether or not we'll end up being able to use 
this particular bit of knowledge about um, the world um, to do something magical uh, in, you know, with, with the world around us. Um, but we do know that in the past, whenever we've made a major step forward in our understanding of how the world works, we've often been able to do more with our world and, and you know, solve more problems. And so, uh, so you know, that's the, I think the only way that we, we can proceed as, as basic scientists is to try to see what we can understand and hope that it opens up more possibilities for what we can do in the world. Um, and then because of these two aspects of, of fundamental science, I think um, it's, it, in some ways it's both sort of an inspiring art form and then a, a hard-nosed practical investment. Um, and, uh, the, and so the occasion of a prize like this is an opportunity, I, I think, to, uh, to thank and, and honor uh, sort of those gurus of the art form and the, maybe the shrewd practical investors um, who both contributed to this result. And so I, I, I wanted to just uh, quickly uh, go through a, a few of them. Uh, first, of course, there's you know, the fact that I, I, everybody comes from their intellectual tradition of, of you know, where they grew up and who they learned from. And I learned a uh, you know, huge amount of, about how to approach the world um, as a scientist from my um, thesis advisor, Rich Muller, who I don't know if he's here, um, uh, who, who is a scientist here at the lab and also at the university. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, that carried on tradition um, here at the lab uh, that has been built up for many years of, of, of innovative ideas for science, but also real rigor in how you, how you examine things. And so I, I, you know, the fact that this grew out of Rich Muller's group, it was no accident at all. Um, and the fact that it was uh, the kind of project that starts with bouncing ideas around between group members and Carl Pennypacker, who I saw before uh, in the back, um, was, was so instrumental in getting this thing going off the ground. Having uh, you know, a, 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 a scientist who, um, who was absolutely uh, you know, undaunted and, and optimistic that we could do anything um, sitting next to me is, you know, is, is I think why we, got, you know, why we got this whole thing started in the first place. Um, then the fact that the project is purely teamwork, I mean, that you, you're, you're, con you're working so closely with, with all, all, all the teammates around, and uh, ma many of them are all over the world now, but there are a number here in the, in the audience today, so I, I think I should ask uh, Greg and, and Alex, Greg Aldrin, Alex Kim, and I know Peter Nugent's here, maybe you can stand up for a quick second. This is representing. with each other and, and you know, we were on the phone all the time and, and trying to try to make sure things work. And and that's the only reason I think that you know results like this come about because you know of, the, of this this team, you know, the, this capability that you can do as a team. Um, I think the the fact that that um, Bob Kahn uh, introduced me to today should, is no accident because he also provided the the environment as the lab director, as the division director at that time, um, who really fostered this work and, and said uh, that you know, this was important to do even if it wasn't obvious at the time that it was right down the main line of the mission of the, of the division. And lab, but he was able to recognize the fact that one of the real jobs of a laboratory like this and of a division like this is to catch the, the possibility that something may turn into something important and be able to foster it and help it grow even when there's all the obvious criticisms of any, any new idea uh, at the time. And, and that, you know, I think that's a real credit um, to, to understanding what it means um, to be a, a director of the vision and understand what it means to be a scientist and to make this kind of thing work. And the fact that you could do that at a place, at a place like this, um, at Berkeley and Berkeley Lab, um, is also something that you, know, you can't find very many places. I think, uh, the, you know, as, as the Chancellor Bergman has said, um, this is an unusual um, place for <coughs> allowing both this group, these groups of people to exist and also the support that you can get at a national lab. Um, and the fact that the DOE had that sense of, of responsibility towards pushing forward the fundamentals of science in that way, it meant that you could actually work for a project that you know, I, I at the time advertised it was going to be a very hard project when we first proposed it. That was going to take us at least three years. Um, and of course, you know, ten years later, um, we actually started having results. But I don't think any of us regretted it. And I don't think that in the end, DOE or the, the, you know, the labs regretted it at all. And and, that, and it's because of that long-term vision, that capability of, of providing support over more than just one little funding cycle, um, that we actually have national labs, and that we have this kind of environment where you get to 
compose something that's a little bit bigger and, and work on something that's a little bit longer. So, uh, so I, those were the, uh, you know, I, I think, all the elements that you needed to, to make it possible to do this kind of work. Um, so finally, uh, of course, in the end, it all boils, boils down to personal and the fact that you know, this team of, of scientists that we, that we, those of us left in the room, represent, and actually I should mention uh, the one who's not here today, Gerson Goldhaber, who um, died recently, and we're sorry that he isn't here today to enjoy this with us. But all of us, um, I think, as, as scientists, depended so much on the on that support and the and the uh, and the involvement of our families and the fact that they were there willing to put up with us disappearing for nights and nights on end or days and days on end as as we you know, worked round the clock to, to generate these these groups of supernova and uh, you know be there at the end of the phone call um, you know my, my parents uh, you know were still uh, the probably the people who get the most out of this Nobel Prize <laughs> <laughs> sense of you know, how, as a community, we were able to do these things together um, was, was really come out of the fact that we were supported by such you know, strong families and, and communities around us. So of course, with that, I have to thank my daughter and my wife for putting up with me ever since. 